fine so we will uh, take a look at uh, Laplace's equation last class we ended just short of my assigning a problem on Laplace's equation right so we will we will get back to that uh, maybe along the way so we will take a look at Laplace's equation and see what we are what we are trying to do okay Laplace's equation. We will return it in terms of C nabla squared P equals 0 right. So in 2D maybe I will write 2D Laplace's equation we will restrict ourselves to 2D right now 3D will follow in a similar fashion. So in two dimensions Cartesian coordinates this turns out to be rho squared phi into x squared rho squared phi do y squared equals 0 and we wrote for an equally spaced mesh and I am writing only for one set right now we wrote for an equally spaced, spaced mesh at the point i comma j in terms of i plus 1 j i minus 1 j i j minus 1 i j plus 1 we wrote this differential equation a representation that we could use on the computer as phi i plus 1 j plus phi i uh, j plus 1 either way plus phi i j plus phi i 4 times phi i j phi i minus 1 j plus phi i j minus 1 equals 0. So this equation the representation at this point i j right we have written in this fashion and we got a truncation error there is a representation error we got the truncation error for that representation for this representation okay. Now right in the beginning minus 4 minus 4 very important minus 4 right in the beginning. I had mentioned that this equation actually gives us allows us when you are given a differential equation in a sense you are given a question find phi and if you find the phi if somebody gives you a candidate phi somebody says I have a solution you would verify it by substituting into this equation and checking whether they have the solution or not right and if they give you something that is a solution the right hand side will turn out to be 0 the left hand side will be 0 it will equal the right hand side. On the other hand if they give you something that is not the solution it will leave, leave what is called a residue okay. So if I, if I give you a phi which is not a solution if I give you a function which is not a solution you substitute it into this equation it would not give you 0 it will leave a residue okay that I am I am repeating again this is something I said earlier in the semester it will leave a residue. The residue is what you get if you substitute a candidate function right into our differential operator here and it should be 0 but it is not 0 and what you end up with is the residue fine we write our equation in this fashion something equals 0 the left hand side should be 0 it is not 0 what is left is called the residue well clearly if on a mesh I give you discrete points on a mesh like I had mentioned in the last class you cannot substitute back into the original equation but you can substitute back into this right so if I were to give you various values of phi i j at the various grid points you could actually substitute that into this equation and find out whether this algebraic equation is satisfied. If the left hand side is not 0 that is it leaves a residue if it leaves a residue that means it does not satisfy this am I making sense. So if you end up if you substitute you have a candidate solution you give me a candidate solution saying here is the solution. So the way I verify it is I substitute it and I find out I try to find out what I get and if I get a residue which I will call Rij because it is the residue at the point Ij okay and that residue is non-zero. So now I change it a little every time you give me a candidate solution I will substitute it into this equation and see evaluate the residue and I will ask the question is the residue 0 
okay. If the residue is 0, you have given me a solution at that point. If the residue is not 0, you have not given me a solution at that point, okay. What you have given me is not a solution at that point. So we have these 5 values, okay. The algorithm that I proposed in the last class, which was uh, the phi at ij is phi at i plus 1 j plus phi at ij plus 1 plus phi at ij minus 1 plus phi at i minus 1 j times I was going to say divided by but times 0 0.25 1 fourth. So what we could do is if you give me something so that the residue is not 0 what I could do is I could reset the value at ij. I can evaluate a value at ij as the average of these 4 values and obviously if I substitute back in it will be 0. You understand? So in a sense, in a sense I have adjusted the value at ij so that it satisfies Laplace's equation the discrete form at that point. Okay, this is called relaxing, it is called relaxing, the process is called relaxation. I have relaxed the value of ij. I have relaxed the value, it is as though it is in tension and I have, given, I have relieved that tension. You understand? I have relaxed the value of ij, I have relaxed the value of phi ij by taking the average and substituting the average value there, it is satisfied. The equation, oh, it is obvious because I got it from the same equation, it should be satisfied, okay, right. So, what is the algorithm that we are talking about now? So, yesterday this is the problem that I started off with at the unit square. A unit square at the origin. So I have the unit square at the origin. We can divide it up into, if I remember right, I divided it up into 9, divided it up so that there are 9 interior grid points. You could, we could of course choose more, okay. And what you do is, so at any of the interior grid points, we do not have the values. The problem is defined so that boundary conditions are given on all four sides. So the boundary condition is prescribed on all four sides, okay. So in theory right now you do not have, I have not assigned a problem so you could just assume any boundary condition, right. You can just make assumptions on values of phi. When I say any boundary condition, values of phi on the four sides of this unit square, okay. You can make an assumption on the values of phi at the four sides of this unit square. So that sets your problem, okay. So you can take uh, phi equals 100 here, maybe phi equals 100 here, phi equals 200 there, phi equals 200. You can pick values, either constant or you can pick uh, something varying as a quadratic or right. You can pick values. You can pick values along on the boundary, only on the boundary. And the way Laplace's equation, the problem is, uh, uh, is specified now that I have given you the boundary conditions. The question is to determine the values at the interior, okay. And we propose to use the averaging process that we just talked about right now, okay. So the first candidate solution that I propose, the first candidate solution that I propose, so I will give it a superscript 0 to indicate that, right, it is the first guess that we have got. At ij and ij are interior points, ij are interior points, I will I will say that it equals 0 i comma j interior points this is the first candidate solution that i propose so if you were substitute if you were to substitute it into the equation you would be left with a residue at every point if you check the residue you will find that in fact because these values are not necessarily zero you may not have guessed them to be zero whereas these are zero you will find that a zero here is not the average value Okay, so this has to be relaxed. Fine. So you set this value to the average of the four neighboring values. Am I making sense? So we come up with the algorithm. I repeat that again, but this time with a superscript. So you say phi i j one is one fourth of phi i plus one j zero plus phi i j plus 1 0 plus phi i 
j minus 1 0 plus phi i j i minus 1 j 0 is that fine okay and of course wherever it is on the boundary so wherever it is on the boundary you take the boundary values wherever it is on the boundary you will take boundary values so for the very first one j minus 1 will be on the boundary i minus 1 will be on the boundary okay for the very first one everybody is with me so in general in general what we could write is in general we can write phi i j n or n plus 1 is this is the relaxation scheme that we are talking about n okay at the nth one so we get n plus 1 from the nth one plus phi i plus 1 j i j plus 1 n plus phi i j minus 1 n plus phi i minus 1 j n is that fine so I have a mechanism I have an automaton I have a way by which I can now automate it right I have something given the value I have you I have an equation given the values at n I can find the values at n plus 1 okay so what the mechanism that I have presumably which we hope the mechanism that I have is a mechanism that if you give me a guess I hope I can get a better guess okay and given a guess if I can always get you a better guess eventually I will converge to a solution that is the hope. So what am I generating what am I proposed to, proposing to generate here I am saying you give me phi i j so I will drop the i because it is for all the interior i j's phi 0 and then you are going to generate phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi n you understand what I am saying you are going you are going to generate you are going to generate these values you are going to generate a sequence of solutions how do you check whether a sequence converges or not there are various tests that you are familiar with right you could do we could use the equivalent of a Cauchy test equivalent of a Cauchy test right Cauchy test basically says you remember Cauchy test Cauchy test basically says phi n minus phi, phi n minus phi m will be less than epsilon epsilon will depend on some capital N for little n little m greater than cap for any little m and greater than n once you are past this capital n right there is an epsilon so that these will only be will, will be that close will be close enough right well we cannot actually do this so what we will do is we will do uh, an engineering approximation right so we will basically ask ourselves the question what happens to phi n plus 1 minus phi n right I will write it as a norm because given these nodal points you can actually come up with functions okay and we want this to be less than some prescribed epsilon prescribed so you will you will prescribe this epsilon okay so now it is clear we are generating a sequence of fees and all we have to do is check whether the fees converge is that fine the other way to do it the other way to do it since we are on convergence and then I will get back to the the other way to do it is to look at R i j at each of the points you will have similarly a sequence of R's right you have you have a sequence of R i j's in fact I will drop the i j just like I did here so you have a sequence of R's which are the residues and what do you want to happen to the residue it should go to 0 so we want the norm of the residue to go to 0. So the other possibility is from here we can say we want the norm of this to be less than epsilon prescribed is that fine so you can test whether the, this actually tells you whether it satisfies the equation or not okay so you can either say you can either say I am generating a sequence of fees does the do the fees converge I am generating a sequence of R's do the R's converge okay this will do for a first order right for, for now for you to start writing some code or whatever it is this is enough we have to actually do make this a little more precise okay 
but right now this test will work for you you can test to see whether whether uh, your code works or not fine are there any questions any questions okay so yeah so if there are no questions uh, we will we'll just get back here so what we have is you are uh, you will notice that the iteration okay so each one, each one of these each each pass through this is called an iteration iteration okay the fee that you get out of it just this is this is this is the jargon you have to learn this the fee that you get out of it is called an iterate right and the process that you are going through is called an iteration okay through each iteration through each relaxation it is called a relaxation also so it is a relaxation sweep right so you will hear people use the term relaxation sweep relaxation sweep so it could be a, you could call it a relaxation sweep right so each relaxation sweep or each iteration will give you a new improved phi i phi at n plus 1 right n plus 1th iterate from the nth iterate okay because this is the n plus first iterate from the nth iterate I will go back there to the if that because it is the n plus first iterate from the nth iterate it is called simultaneous relaxation simultaneous relaxation. You are basically saying that phi at n plus one comes from phi at n. Comes from phi at n. Okay. Comes from phi at n. Is that okay? So, in fact, I think as someone had pointed out last time, we look at this in greater detail. It's actually a linear linear combination. So, it's some p times some matrix times phi at n. In fact, that's what it is. Okay, fine. Now, uh, there's another possibility. So, if I have phi i j n plus one, what I've done is I've done if you look at if you if you come here, if you come here, and you look at this. When I do, when I relax this point, I take the average of these four points, and I get a value here. So what I can do is, I can replace the value here. I can replace the value at that point by what I've just calculated, because it satisfies, right? It satisfies Laplace's equation at that point. Now my approximation to the Laplace's equation. So when I come here, I can use the latest value that I've got. I do not have to use the old value, I can use the latest value as and when I get it. Do you understand what I am saying? Okay. So then we are not relaxing, they are not at the same level, it is not simultaneous relaxation, it is called successive relaxation. So when I come to this point, I can use the latest value there and consequently get the latest value at that point, right? And repeat that, get the latest value at that point. So as you progress, as I progress through taking the averages, as I progress through taking the averages. You will see that I, I am using the latest value at any given at any given point. So when I come here, what happens? The i minus one value is the latest value in general, and the j minus one value is the latest value in general. Okay. So I can in fact write this as phi i plus one j, phi i j plus one at n plus phi i j minus one n plus one plus phi i minus 1 j n plus 1 is that fine and this is called successive relaxation this is called successive relaxation this is just it's just a name right but when people talk about successive relaxation you should understand that they are talking about using the latest value okay fine The first one simultaneous relaxation is also called Jacobi. See that the depending on which direction you are coming from, they have different names and they are attributed to the people that have 
uh, brought up the thought of the algorithm Jacobi iteration. Simultaneous relaxation is also called Jacobi iteration. Is that fine? Okay. Now, how do we how do we figure out whether the code is working or not? How do you find out whether the code works or not? How do you test to see whether the code works or not? You know how to check convergence. If it converges, does that mean that uh, if the, if it converges, does that mean we have a solution? See, we have the following questions: How do we know our code is working? How do you know if it's converging that you're getting the right answer? Right. So we need to answer these questions. How do you know uh, if two of you get two different answers? If two of you get two different answers, you write run the program, and the two of you two of you get two different answers. Which answer is the right answer? Is there a way for us to decide? Right? Is it possible that two people get two different answers? Am I making sense? These are, these, these are natural questions that you have to ask yourself because if you go out and you start solving this problem, right, and two different people are solving the same problem, is it possible that somehow they end up with two different answers? Right? Why would you say it's not possible? But how do we know that? Is there a way we can show that? So you are saying Laplace, the solution to Laplace's equation is unique, okay. Solution to, but what about the discretization? To our approximation, is the solution to our approximation unique? You understand? So in your partial differential equations course, you may have learned that the solution to Laplace's equation is unique, okay. That the solution exists and that it is unique. But how about for our discretization? Right? You understand because we are doing we are only approximating it. So is it possible that, that we have already seen when we talked about machine epsilon that there are a bunch of numbers that are represented by one number? So we have to have a little anxiety saying that am I are we going to get the same answer? Are we are, are all of us going to get the same answer? Okay. So we have we have we have these set of questions that need to be answered. So first we look at is there a way for us when you are given an equation, when you are given an equation nabla squared phi equals 0, phi equals 0 and we have a we have a discrete representation for this equation. Is there a way for us to set up the problem so that uh, we can check whether the program that we write is generating. So we need an answer, we need a solution to this. If you have a solution to this, we are set, okay. So, Laplace equation fortunately is easy that is why I have picked Laplace equation as the first problem that we look at right. Any analytic function is a solution to Laplace's equation right. So the simplest thing is to take z or z squared z is a not z being a complex number is not that interesting z squared yes. So we can take either real or imaginary of z squared as a start I want to keep it simple. So a, a solution is x squared minus y squared. And I invariably start with something like this because I want to keep it easy. So if I were to solve this problem, I will pick a simple. So is this a solution to Laplace's equation? You can substitute and see and it is indeed a solution to Laplace's equation. So on the boundaries here, on the boundaries here, we can pick the boundary condition as it comes from x squared minus y squared. So on the bottom boundary, you can set phi of x comma 0 equals x squared on the right boundary here you can set phi of 1 comma y as 1 minus y squared on the top boundary we can prescribe the boundary phi of uh, x comma 1 is x squared minus 1 sorry x squared minus 1 and on the left phi of 0 comma y is minus y squared and then you would expect that these points would be samples from x squared minus y squared they would actually be sampling the function x squared minus y squared. the solutions here should correspond to x squared minus y squared. 
so this is something that you can try out okay and now this is something that you can try out you have an answer to the problem and therefore you can test to see whether your code actually converges to that answer is that fine okay right and you can see how well it how well does it if it converges how well does it converge is it does it go actually go to the answer what does it go to right you can find that out second question is everybody going to get x squared minus y squared is it possible that the numerics goes somewhere else okay so we will do we will we will do something that mirrors we will do something that mirrors the typical uh, the uh, continuous function the derivation that you would have seen in continuous function i'll just draw this here so if you have if you have these four points what are we doing here what is at the point ij at any given point ij at the interior what is phi ij phi ij is the average of its neighbors so what is an average what 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 is the average the average is not larger than the largest neighbor nor is it smaller than the smallest neighbor so any given point here any given point that we take the average for actually i guess i could have done it just here any given point that you take the average for any given point for which you take the average is not larger than its largest neighbor nor smaller than its smallest neighbor so this point is not larger than its larger neighbor smaller than and this is true of all the interior points it's true of all the interior points okay and therefore can i conclude that the maximum and minimum will actually occur on the boundary the only values that i don't touch that i don't change are on the boundary every other point i ensure every other interior every point on the interior i ensure is larger than the smallest neighbor and smaller than the largest neighbor you understand and all of these satisfy that condition they are all larger than the smallest neighbor and smaller than the largest neighbor consequently the maximum and minimum to the solution must occur on the boundary fine okay so if the maximum and minimum of the solution occur on the boundary what can we say if maximum and minimum occur on the solution of the, on the on the boundary of the solution they occur on the boundary what can we say we'll use this argument now this is called the maximum principle i just write i am i am saying this just for okay i'll just say maximum prin maximum principle okay fine so what 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 we uh, what we are saying is if i instead of writing instead of writing the system of equations <coughs> so if i have i'll still write it as nabla squared phi equals 0 so i replace this by some uh, what did what 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 shall i call it l of h phi equals 0 right so this is some this is this is some system of equations that's what we called it right h is the grid size okay and the discussion that we are having now is is it possible for two people is it possible for two different students to get two different answers and it's important that l is a linear okay that we get a system of equations is it possible now for two people to get two different answers so let's say two people two to two different students get two different answers okay so the two answers two different students get two different answers one gets the answer capital phi 1 say i'm making it capital phi so that we don't confuse it with our iterates okay and the other gets the answer capital phi 2 okay so we do the usual mathematical trick because we know we have a linear equation what are we going to do we're going to look at what is the difference between the two answers phi 1 minus phi 2 because the equation is linear because the equation is linear this is also a solution to laplace's equation right because the equation is linear this is also a solution so if this is some phi this is the difference lh phi is lh phi 1 minus lh phi 
you understand because because it is linear because it is linear the L actually distributes across it because it is linear it is just a system of equation linear system of equations in this case and therefore this satisfies Laplace's equation right what are the boundary conditions that it satisfies remember both phi 1 and phi 2 satisfy my x squared minus y squared boundary condition therefore phi 1 minus phi 2 the boundary condition is 0 now we use the maximum principle the maximum and minimum occur on the boundary and that is 0 right so the only function for whom maximum and minimum occur on the boundary and that is 0 is phi is identically 0 is that clear okay so as I said this sort of mirrors the proof that you would have seen possibly in uh, for the differential equation itself so yes it will turn out that if you do if you solve this problem if two different students get two different answers the possibilities are both of you have the wrong answer right that is one obvious possibility or one of you has the right answer right and one of you has the wrong answer okay right after you have been programming enough you you start with the feeling that you do not you do not start with the confidence my answer is right your feeling always is that it is likely that your answer is wrong you have to start with the assumption the presumption is my answer is wrong and you have to work to show to yourself convince yourself that the answer is right is that okay fine right so here we have uh, here we have what should I say uh, we have shown that we have shown that the solution the answer is uh, unique we need to show now whether the scheme always converges we will look at that right but before we go there I have just quietly written this as LH let us figure out what is what is this L what is the nature of this L what is the nature of this operator L okay fine so uh, back here so there are two possible numbering schemes that you can two possible there, there are different ways by which you can number these okay intuitively if you look at the way I have written this if you look at the way I have made these pink colored dots the assumption is that I have numbered this uh, this possibly is 1 1 or 0 0 or whatever it is and you know I have numbered them in an incre increasing fashion of i and an increasing fashion of j right in fact I do not even have to tell you but instinctively a lot of you will assume that that is what I am doing okay so we number this in this sequential fashion right that is what we have done but is it possible for me I, having gone through this process I now understand that it is only the interior points that are unknown that need to be determined. So possibly I can number the interior points in a sequential fashion and then number the boundary points okay fine so one one way to do it is you say you use two subscripts you use two subscripts the other way to do it is that you basically number the boundary points after this so that is 9 so and this becomes 10 11 12 13 14 and so on okay you could also run, number them in a random fashion would that make a difference do you think so this is something for you to think about if I were should I do this sequentially would it matter if I started my iterations from the top would it matter if I iterated I relax this point this point this point and did it uh, did it in the reverse fashion okay or could I can I just do it in random can I just do it at random we should always get the answer the question that the question that is still there we should always we would expect that we will get the answer we will look at we will we will we will see whether we can throw some light on that idea right now intuitively I am getting a lot of head shakes saying that you do not expect I do not expect it either you do not expect from what we have seen we do not expect that the answer will change we are taking averages we do not expect that the answer will change so there are different ways by which you can sweep through sweep through the domain not necessarily from left to right bottom to top not necessarily in that direction that you can sweep in any direction 
and instinctively the way we number it is the way we tend to sweep it therefore the way we number it becomes important okay. So we will definitely get to the answer then the second question is how fast do we get to the answer right okay. So we will look at those issues right now let us stick to this so I have numbered it in this fashion 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and we can write for each one of these we can write an equation. And as a consequence, we will get a linear system of equations. So, for each one of those, we write an equation. For the first one, I get phi at 2 plus phi at 4 or phi at 4 plus phi at 2, it does not matter, minus phi at 1. you want minus 4 I keep forgetting I will let me I will start the other way around I will do it in a I will do it in a sequential fashion minus 4 phi 1 plus phi 2 plus phi 4 plus phi 25 plus phi 11 equals 0 is that fine. What is the next one turn out to be? Phi 1 minus 4 phi 2 plus phi 3 plus phi 6 or phi 5 minus phi 12 plus phi 12 equals 0. Are you making sense? We will write one more. So uh, there is no phi 1, phi 2 minus 4 phi 3 plus phi 6 and then you get 2 boundary points plus phi 15 plus phi 13 equals 0. Of course the boundary points we are going to take over to the right hand side. Okay. In general if I write for a general general point in between as I go down to an interior point which is only surrounded by interior points I will get phi uh, if I am at the point i remember I have only one subscript now okay phi i minus 1 plus phi i minus 4 phi i plus phi i plus 1 that is the easy one. So you can see the second derivative i plus 1 i minus 1 then what do you get plus phi i plus n where n is the number of points in that row in a given row. So phi 1 there were 3 in the row 1 plus 3 gives me 4, 2 plus 3 gives me 5, 3 plus 3 gives me 6 okay there are 3 in that row and subsequently I will get a phi i minus n now. and this should equal 0 this is a this is the general situation okay coming back here if you look at it if I have a general point if there are n of them in this row this is minus 1 this is plus 1 this is minus n there will be we will have to go back n this is minus n that is plus n. Okay, so with a single subscript we can actually go i minus 1, i plus 1, i minus n, i plus n. Is that fine? So we can really write this as a system of equations, we can really write this as a system of equations. Uh, maybe I will write it in a bigger fashion than a system of equations. I will write it there in the first, uh, we can really write it as a system of equations. which will be minus 4, 1 and what whole bunch of zeros. So this is the first one then you have to go to i plus 1, i plus n. So when you get to i plus n there will be a 1 there lots of zeros this is the structure of the matrix that you get. What is the next one? 1 minus 4 
1 lots of zeros till you get to a 1 on the diagonal there lots of zeros is that fine and you get 0 1 minus 4 1 lots of zeros 1 on the diagonal so the equation keeps on shifting to the right okay lots of zeros after that and this will keep on shifting to the right till you get to a point where a 1 will appear right till you, till you get to a point where you have gone to the second row now from the first row something is contributing while you are in the first row the 1 below goes to the right hand side okay so you get lots of zeros 1 minus 4 1 lots of zeros 1 lots of zeros in case this doesn't make sense I'm going to erase this I'll write it as a I'll just draw lines so you get a minus 4 on the diagonal and we are all agreed that that minus 4 is there for all the points right so you get a minus 4 on the diagonal there is nothing to the left of this but you will get a plus 1 on the super diagonal on the first diagonal above the diagonal fine and you will get a, a plus 1 so there is a minus 4 here you will get a 1 here on the sub diagonal fine so that takes care of the second derivative in the x direction in our in our primary coordinate direction then what happens then you have n away from this you have a 1 all of these in between are zeros they are all zeros okay and you are going to have a bunch of ones you are going to have a bunch of ones till you come to the right boundary when you get to the right boundary or the top boundary right when you get to the top boundary or the right boundary at each of the boundaries you have to be a bit careful so here n away you will get a 1 there am I making sense okay there is 1 at the bottom and you will get 1s along this 1s along this and 1s along this this corresponds to the top boundary this corresponds to the bottom bottom boundary there are zeros here which correspond to the bottom boundary there are zeros here that correspond to the top boundary here as you go along just like you did not have any entry here as you go along as you come to a left left entry or a right entry you will get a 0 as you come to the left boundary or the right boundary you will get a 0 does that make sense I still see a few faces that are confused when you have when you have when you are at the boundary when you go when you traverse along this when you come to this there is there is no there is no the entry here is known it is not an unknown so that goes to the right hand side so you do not get a plus 1 that will be a 0 just like that with the very first one there will be no i minus 1 entry that will also be right there will, there will be no i minus 1 entry that will also be 0 okay when you go to the top you go to the top there is no i plus n entry when you go to the bottom there is no i minus n entry okay the points right next to the right boundary have no i plus 1 entry the points right next to the left boundary have no i minus 1 entry the ones at, at the bottom will have no i minus n entry no i plus n entry okay so that the no i plus n entry no i minus n entry and then embedded in here there will be zeros with the frequency of n every time you go through you come to the end there will be a zero because there is no there is no right hand there is no point to the right it is a known and all of those points will come to the right hand side so this equation this matrix a what does it multiply it multiplies phi 1 phi 2 phi 3 phi subscript 1 phi subscript 2 phi i phi I will make it capital M because I made n the number of values in the row phi m there are m m interior grid points and this equals these will be the values from the boundary conditions known 
values from boundary okay these are prescribed fine so we actually get something that looks like a phi or ax equals b a phi equals b you have a system of equations okay some observations the equations are symmetric about the diagonal the equation that we get the matrix that we get a is symmetric about the diagonal the diagonal entries are negative the off diagonal entries are positive so it has some nice structure to it okay uh, you can just go look it up I am not going to do this it falls into the category of something that is known as an M matrix we'll just check that out so the diagonal entries are negative the off diagonal entries are positive it is symmetric right so there must be maybe there is something neat that we can do with this we can check to see whether what what kind of right what what it is that we are so, but we have a system of equations we have a system of equations let us now see whether uh, what it is that we are actually doing when we solve the system of equations okay what is it that we are actually doing when we solve the system of equations so when we do when we do Jacobi iteration Jacobi iteration okay what are we doing the matrix A can be partitioned as the diagonal a diagonal matrix D plus a lower triangular matrix plus an upper triangular matrix just to give you an example the diagonal matrix D is minus 4 times I right the diagonal matrix D is minus 4 times I fine the remaining part lower and upper triangular you can extract out I think that you can do so when we do Jacobi iteration what we are actually doing is we are saying phi n plus 1 equals you can check this out D inverse phi n minus well maybe we will work this out next time I think uh, we are coming close to so what you can do is you can just take take the equation phi n plus 1 equals we are trying to find just to give you an idea as to where we are going we are trying to find out what is this p okay we are trying to find out what is this p so that we can say something about how this equation converges so far what we have shown us that if you get a solution it will be the solution and it is unique you understand what I am saying now what we want to do is we want to see whether uh, does it actually converge how fast does it converge how fast does it get there right? now we are talking about the operational part it is nice to know that if two people get two different solutions right I mean we know that if everything works two people should not get two different solutions the solution is unique now we want to know that we want to answer the question how fast do I get it I would like to get it today I would like to get it in a few minutes I do not want it to take forever to get the answer so how fast what can I do the issue is if I can figure out if I can answer the question how fast will it how fast does it how long does it take to get it then I can if I there is a systematic way by which I can do it then I can ask the question why is it taking for so much time is there something that I can do to make it faster okay remember always we always ask how good is it and if you are able to determine to answer that question right the objective of asking how good is it is not just find out how good is it but if we understand the question in the way we answered it it may help us improve right whatever it is that we are asking how, how well does it converge and we can figure out right a way to improve the convergence if you are unhappy with the convergence is that fine okay so I will see you in tomorrow's class we will look at this uh, Jacobi iteration and see what is happening tomorrow's class. Thank you.